Methodist Church. It's a beautiful day out there today. A little, the wind makes it a little chilly, but uh, it's supposed to warm up to the 70s today, so a lot better than what we've had the last few days. Um, good to see everybody here today. Remember, there's cards in the pews for if you're a visitor and you want to fill out that card, um, let us know who you are. Or if you have a prayer request or prayer concern, you can fill out the card and pass it up with the offering plate, and we'll uh, read that at that time. Uh, some announcements I'll go through real quick here. We had uh, Sunday school at 10 a.m. and uh, we'll also have today at 4 p.m. Kids Club kids club and Youth Group um, and then at 6 p.m. will be our evening worship service and directly following the evening, evening worship we'll have a uh, lead team meeting at 7 p.m. And then um, Wednesday, at, uh, we're continuing at 6 p.m. our dinner and devotion groups on uh, Wednesday. That's for all ages, for kids and adults. And then looking ahead on um, April 20th, Saturday, April 20th at 8.30 a.m., we'll have our next uh, men's breakfast and devotion. And then on the 22nd is when the Mountain Mission truck will be here. So if you could have everything that you wanted to donate here by the 21st. That would be helpful. Um, also looking ahead, uh, Homecoming Sunday is on the tw May 26th. It's Homecoming Sunday and a graduation recognition. Um, so just wanted to get that out there. It's in your bulletin, it's not on the slide. But um, birth do we have any other announcements before I go on? Birthdays coming up this week. Uh, we've got on the 10th, Earl Wright. On the 11th, Diane Weaver. On the 12th, Jaden Dyer. Also on the 12th, Rick Taylor. And on the 13th, Cody Condy. 
So if you see those people, um, wish them happy birthday. And anniversaries this week, we've got none. So our prayer list monitors this week are Barbara Butler and Linda Walton. Kim corrected me that it's Walden, not Walton. I'm, I knew that, but sometimes when you're up here, things don't come out right. So now if everyone would please stand and uh, greet one another in fellowship. Thank you so much for the life and health and house that you've given us to come worship you. And just ask today, Lord, that your spirit is here and present in all of our lives, Lord. And um, 
that we will experience your presence, Lord, as we worship you today, Lord, in the prayers that are prayed, the message that is given, the word that is spoken here today, Lord, and that we will leave here changed, Lord, so that we can take the love and the hope and the peace and the joy that we receive out into the world that so desperately needs it. And it's in Jesus' most holy name I pray. Amen. And now we'll sing our hymn of praise, Because He Lives. of faith, the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered in Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From him she shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
Now you may be seated as Julie Riggs comes to read it for you. Hear the word of the Lord from 1 Peter 1, 17 through 23. And remember that the Heavenly Father to whom you pray has no favors. He will judge or reward you according to what you do. So you must live in reverent fear of him during the time as <clears throat> time here is temporary residence. For you know that God paid a ransom to save you from the empty life you inherited from your ancestors. And it was not paid with mere gold or silver, which lose their value. It was the precious blood of Christ, the sinless, spotless Lamb of God. God chose him as your ransom long before the world began. But now in these last days, he has revealed for your sake. Through Christ, you have come to trust in God. And you have placed your faith and hope in God because he raised Christ from the dead and gave him great glory. You were cleansed from your sins when you obeyed the truth. So now you must show sincere love to each other as brothers and sisters. Love other, each other deeply with all your heart. For you have been born again, but not to a life that will quickly end. Your new life will last forever because it comes from the eternal living word of God. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. As we come to our time of offering, I would remind you loose change benefits your youth and children's ministry. If you'd like to see how your your uh, Doing as far as the church, you'll find that in your bulletin. And I invite my ushers to come forward at this time. That's right. Lord, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you for the opportunity to be in your house, to worship you, to experience your Holy Spirit ushering us into your presence. And Lord, we know that as we come, there is nothing that you want from us. You've given everything for us. There is nothing that you want us to give you except for ourselves. And so, Lord, help us to be people of Easter, people of the resurrection, people who truly call themselves Christians, many Christs in this world. Let us give our hands, our feet, our hearts, our our souls, our strengths, all that we are for your service. And out of the outpouring of what we give to the world, showing them Christ, we also pour out into these plates a portion of the many gifts that you've blessed us with, that you would receive it and bless it again, multiply it, and use it for your kingdom work. Lord, we thank you so much. It's in your son Jesus' name we pray.
win, first or last? Nope, wrong answer. <laughs> last one. <laughs> Only for girls? Ladies first. All right, so Riley, come up. Let's pray. Let's pray together. Come on, come on, boys. Come on, come on. children, three and one, their siblings, since birth, and they were close to adoption, like in the next month or two, and now um, the courts have decided to go back to their mother, whom they don't really know. So um, Samantha's devastated, obviously, and um, just pleading that we pray that they will change their mind. Gavin and Samantha Tate. Um, about to lose uh, lose kids that they've uh, thought they were going to be able to adopt. So we'll pray for them. Are there others? Yes. I asked prayer last week for Vanessa Smith, who had had a brain aneurysm. She had stood up totally permanent. And she was breathing on her own, doing really good. We'll have to be in the hospital for 30 days. And uh, but I just thank answer prayers. But she was so critical. Okay, a praise for Vanessa Smith on a turnaround. Jim Deaton's traveling. She's traveling today and tomorrow. She's visiting her family. 
So, traveling mercies for Jen. Shirley, thank Shirley provided those. So thanks to Shirley for the flowers. Flowers and the lilies. So I've, I've got a couple. Um, I had a, uh, yesterday I uh, found out about a fraternity brother and a friend that passed away um, yesterday suddenly. Um, so I just want to ask for prayers for his friends and family. His name is Derek Barton. Uh, he was basically the same age as me in college and uh, passed away suddenly yesterday so and then I've got a praise actually that I should have said this last week it's a little easier to say stuff when you're up here than when you're sitting back there but uh, <laughs> um, but on Palm Sunday we went to a church in Bowling Green because Jillian was getting baptized and so she got baptized into a church that she's been attending in Bowling Green and it was a uh, Really great experience, and um, she's in a really good place uh, in her Christian walk. And so, I wanted to say a praise for that. So, are there others? All right, are there unspoken ones today? All right, thanks for Andy. So, we'll go to the Lord in prayer. Lord God Almighty, King of all the universe, we come to you today, Lord, some of us with heavy hearts, Lord, as um, there are things in this world that cause us despair, Lord, um, and we look to you for healing for those things, Lord. Um, on our own, we have no hope, Lord. We, on our own, we tend to fight and argue with each other, Lord. And um, on our own, there's not much peace, not much love. But when we focus on you, Lord, and we turn our eyes to Jesus, we have hope in every situation. We have peace that passes all understanding. And we have love for those who seem to be unlovable, Lord. And we have you to thank for all of that, Lord. And so today, I come to you asking for travel mercies for Jen Deaton as she goes to visit her family today, Lord. Just be with her as she travels and keep her safe and have, help them to have a good time and fellowship, Lord. I'd like to uh, be ask you to be with Evan and Samantha Tate, Lord, during this trying time and ask for a miracle for them, Lord, so that they will get to experience and continue to experience the love that they've had with the children that they want to adopt, Lord. And uh, I'd like to ask that you be with the Derek Barton family and, and all his friends, Lord. Surround them with love and support during this time, Lord. And we have several praises today, Lord. I'd like to praise you for the healing and the miracles in Vanessa Smith's, Smith's life, Lord, and the turnaround that she's had and, continue, and hope that 
that continues, Lord, and that she knows that it was you that did it, Lord. I'd also like to thank you and praise you for Jillian Howell and for what she means to me personally and to this church and that she would continue in her walk with you and grow closer to you, Lord. And just like to thank you for the beauty in our sanctuary, the flowers, the lilies, and for those who have provided them, Lord, to help make this worship service a little more special, Lord. And um, just ask that you be with those who have unspoken requests, Lord. They weren't spoken here aloud today, Lord, but you know what they are. We ask that you be with them and whatever their needs are, Lord, you help them with those, Lord. And now, today, Lord, we, I know that uh, some of us in the past and maybe even some of us today feel like that one lost sheep, Lord, that um, you recklessly go after because you love us so much and um, you recklessly lead the 99 to go after that one lost sheep. And I hope that each and every one of us have either felt like that lost sheep at some time in the past, or if we feel like it today, Lord, that we know and get to experience that reckless love that you have for us. Lord, that, that love that moves mountains that can change our lives in an instant, Lord. And um, I just pray that uh, we will search diligently for that love and want that love more than anything that we want in our whole lives. And turn our eyes to Jesus, who taught us how to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. So we come today, you can see on the title slide, it says it is the second Sunday of Easter. In my humble opinion, there are at least 52 weeks of Easter a year, because every Sunday we come together. Every Sunday, the reason we worship on Sunday is it is the first day of the week. It is the day on which Christ rose from the dead. And it is the day that we remember that Christ is risen and Christ is risen indeed. Last week we heard the story from Luke of the resurrection of Christ from Luke chapter 24 where Mary went and, and there was no body there. There were messengers that told her, he's not here. Why are you looking for a God that's alive among dead people? Don't you remember what he said? And they go and they, they tell Peter and the disciples and Peter goes to the, the tomb and he looks inside and he goes, huh? I don't know what happened. I'm going to go home and think about this. And that's where we left it. But I'm going to pick up on Luke chapter 24 with verse 13, because we went through verse 12 last week. We're going to continue the story of the resurrection in a story known as the walk to Emmaus. I invite you to open up your hearts, your minds, your ears, and hear the word of the Lord. That same day, two of Jesus' followers were walking to the village of Emmaus, seven miles from Jerusalem. As they walked along, doing what they, as they walked along, they were talking about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things, Jesus himself suddenly came and began walking with them. But God kept them from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing so intently as you walk along? They stopped short, sadness written across their faces. Then one of them, Cleopas, replied, you must be the only person in Jerusalem who hasn't heard about all the things that have happened there in the last few days. What things, Jesus asked. 
The things that happened to Jesus, the man from Nazareth, they said he was a prophet who did powerful miracles, and he was a mighty teacher in the eyes of God and all the people. But our leading priest and other religious leaders handed him over to be condemned to death, and they crucified him. We had hoped he was the Messiah who had come to rescue Israel. This all happened three days ago. Then some women from our group of his followers were at his tomb early this morning, and they came back with an amazing report. They said his body was missing, and they had seen angels who had told them, Jesus is alive. Some of our men ran out to see, and sure enough, his body was gone, just as the women had said. Then Jesus said to them, you foolish people. You find it so hard to believe all that the prophets wrote in the scriptures? Wasn't it clearly predicted that the Messiah would have to suffer all these things before entering his glory? Then Jesus took them through the writings of Moses and all the prophets, explaining from all the scriptures the things concerning himself. By this time, they were nearing Emmaus and the end of their journey. Jesus acted as if he were going on. But they begged him, stay the night with us since it is getting late. So he went home with them. As they sat down to eat, he took the bread and blessed it. Then he broke it and gave it to them. Suddenly their eyes were opened and they recognized him. And at that moment, he disappeared. They said to each other, didn't our hearts burn within us as he talked with us on the road and explained the scriptures to us? And within the hour, they were on their way back to Jerusalem. There they found the 11 disciples and others who had gathered with them, who said, the Lord has really risen. He appeared to Peter. Then the two from Emmaus told their story of how Jesus had appeared to them as they were walking along the road and how they had recognized him as he was breaking the bread. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So we go through life. There are things that are slowly revealed to us. There are things that we, we find entertaining. There are There's a captivation when things are being revealed to us. There's, there's things that we watch, things that we see, things that we do. And it's interesting when when something comes to light that you didn't expect it. There's, there's a show called Undercover Boss. Have you ever, you ever seen this show? I've not actually watched much of it. I've seen a couple, of, uh, a little bit of an episode, but the whole premise is that a boss dresses up as a normal worker. You know, the president of the company, the CEO, goes down and, and, and does normal work. Be like, if, if Ben put on some overalls and went and, oh, you do that already, never mind. <laughs> They go out in the field and they, they work with the normal person. And they hear the stories, they hear the hardships, they hear, you know, I'm sure it's good when they're there and they're like, man, our boss is terrible. He's a slave driver, you know. They hear that kind of thing. But they also hear the things that their people are going through. They get to identify with them. Uh, they, the walk to Emmaus is kind of like that revealing in a way. Because Jesus is the boss, right? And he's kind of just walking amongst his people and waiting to be revealed. It's not quite like Undercover Boss, like Saturday Night Live had uh, the bad guy from Star Wars act like a normal guy. Of course, he got mad and killed a bunch of people, so that didn't work out well for them. But in the, in the end, the Undercover Boss is someone who comes, and he is in charge. He is in control. He has all the power, but he brings himself to a level where everyone else is. And this walk to Emmaus, we see these guys walking along. And Jesus has come down to where they are. As we ourselves, we find ourselves captivated by books and movies waiting for the reveal. How many of you like to sit down and watch a movie and you're like, I know exactly what's going to happen? You ever seen that? You ever done that? I've sat down many a TV show, many a movie and say, I know exactly what's going to happen. And it's entertaining, but not really what really is entertaining when you're reading a book or you're watching a movie and then something happens and it boom, turns the whole thing sideways. It can be good, bad, or indifferent, but you're like, wow, I did not see that coming. And it makes it compelling. It makes it, it makes it different than what you would expect. We keep waiting for the plot to turn or for a character to be revealed. 
when, when in our personal lives, like when I met Jen, I thought, you know, she's an introvert, she's quiet, you know, and, and we got together and, and when we got married, she began to reveal more of herself. How many of you, when you, if you got married, how many of you knew everything about your spouse when the day you married? How many of you would have probably gone through with it if you did? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> There's a revealing that takes place in that relationship when you, you get married or if you have a great friendship or whatever, in every relationship, there's a revealing that takes place. You all see Jen as a sweet young woman. When I met her, she was an introvert, but she wanted so bad to be an extrovert. I mean, have you seen her hair? <laughs> Nobody, an introvert does not draw attention to themselves the way she does with that. And this, you know, she is a, she is a fighter. She will fight. Don't come by the, don't, don't drive through the church parking lot on a hockey night. Because you will hear her inside come, what's wrong with you? Show the fuck! She she is the one. Everybody's like, men are sports. Guys. No, she is the one. She is the one. And she has revealed her. Yeah, she's not here. I can talk about her all I want. I told her, I was like, you need to go see your family. I'm going to be able to free preach for a little bit. No. But she has revealed herself to me over time. I have revealed myself more to her. And in revealing, we've discovered a depth of a relationship that took time in the revealing. It's kind of like one of those home makeover shows where you've got this old house and they, they send you away and then they come back and they got the bus in the way. And you're standing there waiting, right? You're waiting. You're like, oh my gosh, this is my house on the other side. What's it look like? And you wait and you wait. And they're like, move that bus. And they move the bus. And you're like, that's not my house. <laughs> They tore down the neighbor's house and rebuilt it in your house. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, but it's it, sometimes it's different. They have to tear it all the way down and bring it back up. Sometimes they just take it because it's a lot like God. You know, he's the architect. He knows what your life is supposed to look like. He knows what the design said, but some handyman has come in, didn't know what they were doing, and kind of ramshacked your house and left it all disheveled. And they've come in, and they've just completely fixed it. And they've revealed it. When it's revealed, you're like, wow. And it's overwhelming when it's revealed. Well, let me tell you, there's an overwhelming revelation that's been taking place since the very beginning of time. There's an overwhelming revelation in our lives that's been taking place since the very beginning. Since God said, let there be light, there has been a revelation taking place. And that revelation is a revelation of God. Throughout all of human history, God is saying, move that bus. And he's showing us more and more of himself each and every day. He has shown himself through creation. When he made Adam and Eve, he'd walk in the garden with them. And, you know, we sing the song in the garden, and he walks with me, and he talks with me. And we imagine what that would be like. They knew what that was like. They walked with him. They talked with him. They, were, they saw God, and they were building this relationship with God, and he was revealing himself to them and through them to the world. And then... After that, he revealed himself to Abraham when he said, be my people and I'll be your God. I will protect you. I will watch over you. And so he took Abraham and Abraham's son, Isaac, and Isaac's son, Jacob. He takes Jacob and he reveals himself to Jacob and says, you know what? Jacob means deceiver. You've been a bad guy most of your life. But you know what? I'm going to change that. I'm going to change your whole life. I'm going to make you into a, a nation. I'm going to call you Israel. And he reveals himself to Jacob in this way. And begins the process of, of creating Israel, the nation. This Joseph, the son, is revealed by God through dreams. And he saves his people and he brings them out of a horrific famine to Egypt. And we know that when they get to Egypt, they're there for 400 years. And a new Pharaoh comes in and the new Pharaoh doesn't remember all the good things that Joseph did. And he begins to treat God's people harshly. And God reveals himself to the Egyptians. God reveals himself to his own people. And he reveals himself to Moses. And as he reveals himself to Moses, he reveals himself through Moses as well to the world. I mean, when he showed himself to Moses, Moses is out minding his own business. And he's like, there's a bush on fire over there. It ain't burning up. I'm going to go check that out. And then the bush started talking to him. How many of y'all be like, nope. 
I mean, today we'd be looking around for the Bluetooth speaker. Ah, oh, yeah, this is just some kind of hoax. No, they didn't have that back then. A burning bush not consumed starts talking to you and says, this ground is holy, and it's holy because God is there. And God is revealing himself through that crazy incident. And he calls Moses and uses Moses. And when Moses brings the people out of the promised land, the Egyptian army is behind him and the, and the sea, the Red Sea is in front of them and they're stuck. And God says, let me reveal myself again as your savior. And he blows the wind and he opens the sea, brings them through and the Egyptians are drowned. But that's not the end. God continues to reveal himself. He, he reveals himself through the judges, Deborah. The Deborah, the woman judge, you know, who told her, war master, you need to go to war. And he said, I'm not going unless you go. And she said, I'll go, but it's my victory now because you're a child. He reveals himself through Deborah. He reveals himself through Samson. You all remember Samson, right? He was arrogant. He was not a great guy. He did everything that he wasn't supposed to do, and God still revealed himself through him. Ehud, the left-handed judge. Gideon, the one who was questioning, I'm going to put out this fleece, and if it's wet and the ground is dry, then I'll do it. Oh, well, if it's dry and the ground is wet, then I'll do it. Oh, okay, both times. He reveals himself to Gideon, and he saves his people. Then we come to David. David, the man after God's own heart. David, God reveals himself in David, through David. And brings his, his, his people to fruition, his nation, completely together. But even after David, God continues to reveal himself to the people through the prophets. Elijah, Elisha, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Hosea, Micah, Samuel, and all the other prophets. They begin to speak for God. They begin to take the messages of God. They begin to preach for God, for the people of God. They tell messages about a Messiah who will come, a, a Savior who will bring everything to co completion. They have all of this, and then they keep preaching that, and then we come to John the Baptist. And John the Baptist reveals God in a new way. Because John the Baptist says, God's about to do a new thing. He's about to do something amazing. He's about to do something you've never seen before. Look, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. God has revealed himself as a man. And that man is Jesus. That same Jesus who would live and preach and do miracles and walk and talk was then nailed to the cross. He was put into the grave. And that was the end. Or so they thought. As we look at the resurrection, the walk to Emmaus is, is, is hilarious in one respect because as we look at the walk to Emmaus as the beginning and Jesus just kind of shows up and he's walking along and he says, what are you guys talking about? And then the people begin to tell Jesus about Jesus. And I think that's funny because I often think I probably do the same thing. I'm often telling Jesus about Jesus when he's saying, you know what, I'm standing right here. You shut up and listen and you would know more. It's funny because Jesus is sitting there. And he's listening to these people tell him about himself. And then he's like, you know, you're wrong, Colonel Sanders. This is what it really means. And so the walk to Emmaus is the most significant thing that Jesus did in his resurrection. Now, some of you will argue with me. Well, you know, the miraculous catch of fish, that was pretty significant. It restored Peter, but it's not the most important thing. Well, well what about the Great Commission? You know, go into all the world. No. It's significant, but it's, it's not, not the most significant thing he did. The... the, the uh, Walk to Emmaus is the most significant thing that he did because as Jesus was walking along, he made everything of his life, his death and his resurrection, he made everything that he did make sense. You understand? He takes the foundation that we call the, we call the Old Testament. They just call them the Torah. They just call them the Bible. He takes all of that and he connects all of that to himself. And he says, this is the foundation that was laid. All of this led to this. 
And it is the culmination of all that. He connects everything together from the very beginning. He says, don't you see, God has been revealing himself since the very beginning of time. And then this is happening because it had to happen. All the Old Testament prophecies, all the stories, they all come to a conclusion in Christ. And without that connection, everything else would be second guessed or of a lesser value. You would say, you know, I don't understand because none of this has any substantiation. He sustained it all. He, he, he showed it all. He put a foundation underneath all of it. And the amazing thing for us is because Christ is risen and because he lives, he is still revealing himself in the world today. He's still revealing himself today. He still reveals himself in the world today. He revealed, reveals himself in creation. This is a picture that I took with the youth group at the Red River Gorge. When you're down there, you just see all these mountains. You see all this greenery. You see all this stuff. You hear the wildlife, the, the wolf man of Wolf County. No, I've never seen him. But you see all these things. Have you ever gotten up early and seen the sun rise? you ever seen a sunset, the, the orange and the purple and all that stuff? You've seen the beautiful stars in the sky. Scripture tells us that all of creation is a testament to the glory of God. God reveals himself even to this day in the things that he has made. He reveals himself in events both good and bad. If y'all don't know, that's uh, why I straight peeled that off Facebook. Good and bad. The bad things that happen. You know, we often hear God works together the for good, all for those who love him. But the thing is, God doesn't want bad things to happen. But when bad things do happen, God can still reveal himself into him. Have you ever, since being here, you know, we, we had a good crowd last week. Today is the Easter sale. We're about half off. Um, but we had a good crowd last week. I've seen better crowds, though. They were at funerals. And it's funny because people will gather together. And when they come together, even in grief, even in grief, they can come together. They can hear about what God is doing in the world and in the lives and the testimony, testimony and the witness of the person who has passed away. You know, when I die, I hope there, there are a lot of people there, but I hope they're there saying, man, I really saw Christ through this guy. I want to be part of that revealing in their life. Good things and bad things. Good things happen and they 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 celebrate. Uh, I'm going to throw you guys under the bus for a minute. Their life was not good. It was okay. But there were problems. There were some bad things. And God took those bad things and he made them good. And when he revealed himself to them, everything changed. Everything changed. I'm going to quote you, Billy. Billy said, my life is different, and I want my boy to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. He wants that for him because he went through the good, he went through the bad, and now he's back with the good. There are others who have sacrificed for us because of God in their life. For me, it was my grandmother who kicked out my door every Sunday morning and drug me to church. I'm not going to use the drug joke that I always use. That she was a source of my drug problem because she drugged me to church every week. She was that person who cared for me. She was the person who showed Christ. She was the person who revealed Christ to me because she cared enough to care for me. There's also an awakening within our own conscience where we realize that we can't reform ourselves or earn a place in God's family. There is no self-help. There is nothing that we can do on our own. And then Christ reveals himself to us. Scripture tells us this in Isaiah 64, 6. It says, we are all infected and impure with sin. We display our righteousness, righteous deeds, and they are nothing but filthy rags. I heard one person one day say, the best we can do is use toilet paper. This is my last Sunday as a preacher. <laughs> the best we can do is filthy rags. When we try to help ourselves, we realize that we can't do it. And then Christ reveals himself through the Holy Spirit into our life to say, you are not alone. The Holy Spirit comes and he courts us. He doesn't force us. He doesn't say, you must follow. He 
He says, God loves you. He wants you. And it doesn't matter how many times you're screwed up. It doesn't matter how much guilt or shame you're carrying. I want to take all of that from you. As God, Christ reveals himself, he says, I want to take it all. He doesn't force it. He just says, I'm here. And the last thing that reveals Christ is through us, through the church. We are the body of Christ. If people are not seeing Christ in us, then we're not doing something right. We are the body. I see Christ in you. Through your kindness, through your words, through your actions, are we showing the world Christ? And then, of course, on the road to Emmaus, on the road to Emmaus, Jesus explained to them. He brought them up to speed. And then he acted like at the end of the journey, they're like, oh, we're here. And he's like, well, see you later. Like, oh, you should come with. Oh, okay, I'll come with you. And he goes to their house, and it's really weird because when he goes to their house, it seems by reading the story that he takes the position of the host, right? Because if he goes to their house, they should be the one saying, "Here, let me get you something." But it says, "No, Jesus sat down, and Jesus takes the bread. Jesus blesses the bread. Jesus breaks the bread. Jesus serves them." It's reminiscent of a time when Jesus had five thousand people show up, and he could have said, "Go home," but he said, "He said, take seat," and he breaks the bread and he shares with them. It's reminiscent of a time in the upper room that we just talked about. About a week ago, a little over a week ago, where Jesus invites his disciples in, and he looks at the, the ones that will deny him, the ones that will betray him, the ones that will flee like rats and hide. And he breaks the bread. He says, this is who I am. When he breaks the bread on this Emmaus experience, when he breaks the bread and serves as host in these people's own house. When he breaks the bread, it says, when they received the bread, their eyes were open. They're like, oh, it's Jesus! And he's like, see ya. Boom. And he's gone. Jesus' body, Jesus' life is a revelation of God for us. And as Jesus as we come today, we remember that Christ has revealed to us in the breaking of the bread. When he broke that bread, he said, this is my body. It's broken for you. When he breaks that bread and says it's broken for you, he invites you in. He invites you into a relationship with you. He invites you to see him. When he breaks the bread, he says, Ha ha, you couldn't before, but now you see me. Now you see me. As we come to communion today, as we prepare to come to communion today, are you looking for him? Are you seeking him? Are, are you going to knock? For the door to come open, are you going to seek and find? Are you going to ask so that it will be given to you? Will you be invited in and receive that invitation? Will you watch as the bread is broken? Will you remember that his life and his body was broken? Will you remember that the blood shed at Calvary ran down that cross? And that blood is represented in the wine that we drink. It reminds us that we are loved. We are forgiven because God has revealed himself to us in Christ. Theologically, a lot of places come to this from different directions. Some would say, you know, that you have to have this relationship with Christ before you can come here. I would tell you that as they ate, they saw Christ. As you come, expect to see Christ. I'm going to say goodbye to our folks online. I'm sorry you're not here. 
But wherever you are, I pray that you experience Christ. I pray that you will go forth, allowing the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit to go before you, to lead you, to guide you. And the reason you're going forth is so that they will see all of them in you. So that when we look, when people look in the mirror, we see Christ. When people look at us, they see Christ. What a day that will be. Go in peace, folks, online.